Metal Gear Solid is my favorite franchise in all of gaming. Metal Gear Solid, meanwhile, is my least favorite entry in that series. Here's why. The stripped-down summary of MGS1 is that it's an arcade-style stealth action game. You enter a series of rooms and your objective boils down to getting from A to B, with guards, cameras, and other obstacles that make getting from A to B trickier, and every so often there's a boss fight to shake things up. For the first hour of raw gameplay, that's MGS1. You sneak around in various rooms, deal with various puzzles, and fight a boss every 10 minutes. That first hour is the part of MGS1 I enjoy the most, and the part I'm willing to bet the majority of fans enjoy the most. It's not amazing, but it's paced so well that it's next to impossible to be bored or frustrated. And had MGS1 kept that design philosophy going for another two hours, I'd probably love this game. But it's a precise moment after Psycho Mantis goes down that the entire game goes down with him. What follows in those remaining two hours is almost a solid hour's worth of linear, boring backtracking. Minus two rooms, neither of which are any fun to sneak around in, the rest of the rooms from that point on are either filled with gun cameras or nothing at all. Everything else boils down to a series of clunky set pieces and tedious, frustrating boss fights. MGS1 tries to become a straight-up action game. Problem is that the more action-oriented gameplay of MGS1 is way more clunky and unenjoyable. You can't manually aim. To run and gun, you have to hit both the shoot and crouch button at the same time, and if you don't hit them in the right order, you're gonna crouch by accident. And hand-to-hand -hand combat boils down to the exact same button combo over and over. The only incentive I even have to play past Mantis' boss fight is the boss fight against Vulcan Raven, which is not only the best fight in the whole game, but one of the best fights in the series. Raven and Rex's fights are the only ones to incorporate any actual stealth in this stealth action game, and they're both that much stronger as a result. From Ocelot to Mantis, the fights were never really anything to write home about, but they all work within the limitations of MES1's controls and they are perfectly enjoyable as a result. But minus Rex and Raven, the rest are a goddamn nightmare. The sniping controls were god-awful, and you're only ever limited to a tiny sliver of space when battling Wolf both times, so both of her boss fights suck as a result. The hind is easy in one note, but it drags on for way too long that it just becomes boring. The fight against Liquid is just a much more annoying version of the Grey Fox fight, without any of the creativity that kept it from feeling repetitive, and that final jeep chase legit makes me feel motion sick. MGS1 is a two-hour game stretched to three hours, and I only really like one hour and some change. There's tons of atmosphere and excellent music, but it's in service of some really bare-bones level design. All the rooms have an amazing aesthetic, but functionally speaking, none of them really do anything to make the act of actually sneaking around feel all that satisfying or fun. It doesn't help that the whole game literally only has eight rooms with guards in them, nine if you count that one guard in the Rex hangar. Sure, there's VR mode, but that's a mode that completely discourages creativity, since it's ranked on speed over efficiency. More than that, it's forced stealth, where getting spotted means instant failure and half the fun of a stealth action game is adapting to any hairy situation when you fuck up. Can't do that if it's game over every time you get spotted, but according to a lot of people, the focus of this game isn't the gameplay, it's the story, right? The premise of MGS1 is that a guy with no lease on life undertakes a solo sneaky mission to stop terrorists from launching a nuke, and in the process, finds his lease on life. Perfectly fine video game premise. What drags it down is all the twists and turns beneath the surface. It turns out the bad guys accidentally killed the one person who could activate Metal Gear Rex, and without him, there's no nuclear threat. So these guys concoct this elaborate scheme to manipulate the hero, Solid Snake, into activating Rex for them. How? By giving him the override card, making him think he'll deactivate Rex, and hoping he'll figure out the convoluted trick behind how the card works, and trying to kill him along the way multiple times so I guess he won't get suspicious. Even though he doesn't get suspicious when one of the villains who straight up tells him the guy who told him about Pal deactivating Rex was one of the bad guys all along. The actual plot is jumbled nonsense, dressed pretty by excellent production value for its time. How can a game be story-driven if the story is complete nonsense? Well, because the real appeal isn't the actual story, but the cutscenes and the characters. MGS1 is full of interesting, well-rounded characters. Problem is, they're all incredibly underdeveloped, and what few scenes that aren't giant exposition dumps tend to be melodramatic to the point where it becomes nauseating. You know, I don't use makeup the way other women do. I hardly ever look at myself in the mirror. I've always despised that kind of woman. I always dreamed of becoming a soldier. <laughs> Around the halfway point, Snake is captured and gets tortured by Ocelot. We can endure or risk dying and starting over from our last save point, or we can give up and end the torture then and there at the expense of Meryl's life, being forfeited over to Ocelot. In theory, this is a cool bit of in-game storytelling. The different endings depend on whether or not the player can endure that frustrating button mash. But in execution, I always just let Meryl die because why do I give a shit? She was barely in the game and I hated every single time she showed up and whimpered some annoying melodramatic monologue. Harding Killer Solid Snake would not give a shit about some girl he only knew for like 50 minutes. Meryl!
The villain scenes and some of Snake's scenes could be a great bit of fun, but that stuff constantly gets undercut by expository monologues and melodramatic death scenes for characters that barely had screen time. The most interesting villains are barely in the game. Meanwhile, Liquid Snake, the main villain and least interesting member of Foxhound, hogs up all the screen time to ham it up. Mind you, Cam Clark like David Hayter and the rest of the voice actors do a great job, but most of the time everyone is just talking at each other instead of actually engaging with one another in real interesting scenes with proper give and take. Snake is an icon of gaming. He's badass yet goofy, worldly yet socially awkward, really smart yet really stupid. He's a great character, but I just don't buy his character development. We're told multiple times that he enjoys all the killing, but nothing in them just one actually supports that claim. He goes from living for himself to living for others, but the woman he undergoes that change for, he just met. Kojima can create interesting characters and has something to say with each of his games, but he's not very good at doing anything of value with his characters and his message often tends to feel way too preachy. As a result, MGS1 feels like it can't decide if it wants to be Die Hard or some philosophical anime, and one is a lot more fun than the other. Metal Gear Solid is an all-time classic, but it's not a timeless game. And the ironic thing is, is that it's not dated mechanics that hold this game back, but instead questionable design choices. As a result, I'm only enjoying the first hour of raw gameplay and enduring the rest so I can get to Raven and Rex. Too much of it just isn't fun to play no matter how I play it. I'm incapable of enjoying all the backtracking. I can't enjoy that stupid tower or these stupid set pieces that follow, and I damn sure can't enjoy a lot of these boss fights from that point on. I can spice things up when fighting Liquid, but it still feels way too clunky and annoying to be fun. It's not a bad game by any stretch of the imagination, and I can see why it's such a beloved game for many. It truly is a labor of love from everyone involved, and for its time it was a revolution. But Ocarina of Time is just as old, and I still enjoy the hell out of that game 21 years later, so I can't excuse them just one for not being fun to play most of the time. And so I'm giving it a 6 out of 10. I feel that fairly represents the objective quality that went into this game, but also reflects how much I ultimately enjoyed playing it. I'm sure a lot of people disagree with me there, and that's fine. I'm curious how people can look past the stuff that bugged me, or if it's a story that elevates all the questionable design choices for you. Whatever it is, just let me know in the comments. If you actually like this review, then maybe consider subscribing, I don't know. I'm gonna be doing the whole Metal Gear series and a bunch of other games. Either way, thanks for watching, and Otacon never changed his pants after he peed them. <laughs>